Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you, and thank you to the uh, organizers who continue to invite me. James and Lachlan did a great job, in the, and James made a, uh, Lachlan made a point of saying he wasn't going to talk about much geology, but I think there was a fair amount of geology in there, Lachlan. Um, mine is going to be very heavy on the geology, so apologies to the mining engineers and metallurgists in the audience, but just bear with me. This image that we see here is, is superficial. You look at it and say, that's a granite. Well, we're going to talk more about that because that's something that's a little bit unusual in the deposit. And a, a question that's asked all the time is, what's the source of metals? We don't know. We'll probably never know. Um, and the, the, the deposit, whenever a deposit, be an IOCG or other ones, is the host rock actually anything to do with the deposit or is it just merely a host? And we're just going to touch a little bit on that. The, the standard disclaimer. Uh, and we'll start by looking at IOCGs. And we know different deposits like porphyries or IOCGs or, or, or banded iron formations. They, a deposit of, sim, of a one name has multiple deposits in it, like a porphyry or an IOCG. They have similar characteristics, yet there's differences. And that's very well portrayed out on the, on, on the eastern edge of the Galler Craton around Olympic Dam, and I haven't left Prominent Hill off because I don't love them. I do, I love Prominent Hill and Carapatina, but Prominent Hill's just off the map, so that'll be adjusted in the future. But when we look at that, we see Prominent Hill, Carapatina, um, Oak Dam, Island Dam, Acropolis and Weirdo Well deposits that have been known for a long, long time. And, and the colors obviously represent the different rocks out there. We know that the age of the mineralization out in these deposits are all roughly 1590 plus or minus a little bit, but the host rocks are all different. <clears throat> the, the depth of post-mineral cover, which was talked about earlier, varies significantly in these deposits, so that tells us about the post-mineral deformation. Uh, coincident gravity and magnetic anomalies, yes, except for Oak Dam, Oak Dam West, which is interesting itself to be a topic of another time. Uh, typically disseminated sulfides, except for Acropolis really doesn't have any sulfides in it, or minor amount, there's magnetite, apatite veins. And there's invariably a, a, a whole variety of, of Guller range, um, mafic, ultramafic, and then dominated by felsic dikes that also cut through these different areas. So what we're going to do is focus on the host rock at Olympic Dam, because it is the biggest kid on the block. And it sits in the Roxby Downs granite. And, and we won't talk about the other ones, but later on. So we're just going to talk about, just really about the Roxby Downs granite. The image on the left is a, is a you see the Fourier derived vertical gravity gradient. My simplistic brain says, actually, let's just think about it as a residual gravity of one form or another. And the scale bar that we see down there is five kilometers. And that kind of covers our special mining lease in that area. It extends a little, little, little tiny bit out there. And the beauty on, on this thing, and I wish I would have had that 30 years ago, that type of image, the Roxby Downs granite is really those areas in blue. Uh, the areas in green, that light green, represent the edges of the breccia complex. And as we get into that odd shape in the center, that kind of panhandle shape, that's actually where the resource is. We know a lot about the distribution of the Roxby Downs granite, particularly from sterilization drilling that we were doing during ODX times. So there's 300 odd drill holes into that. We know a lot about that area inside the resource outline. And we know less about those areas in the transition really from the ore bodies out into the granite and particularly on the southern edge of the, of the deposit. So if we look at the, the plan map, and everybody would have seen this plan map before, what the one area that, that's really important is off on that southeastern margin, on the, the southern side of that southeastern margin that we're going to focus in. And that's going to be the focus, really, of, of what we're seeing there. Now, what I want to point out back on that residual gravity image is RD2488. That's actually a, a, our drill hole that's furthest to the south or furthest, really, away from the deposit that still has abundance of uh, very fresh Roxby Downs granite in it. And that granite becomes progressively altered as we start approaching that edges of the breccia complex. <clears throat> Fresh Roxby Downs granite, the field of view off of all these P 
pieces of drill core that I'm going to show you, it's all from NQ core. So roughly, you know, four, 45 to, to 50 millimeter across the fields of view. And the Roxby Downs granite was first studied in detail by Bob Creaser as a PhD thesis in 1989. Then we resurrected a lot of going back and looking at the granites um, back in, in um, just the last 10 years, really. Roxby Downs granite, very typical A-type granite, relatively undeformed, eco-granular, medium to coarse grain, alkali feldspar is the dominant, is the dominant mineral, and then subequal amounts of quartz and pledge, and then the whole swath of minor, uh, 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 sorry, accessory minerals. Besides things like magnetite, ilmenite, titanite, apatite, zircon, which is kind of typical, we also see alunite, fluorite, tourmaline, anchorite, uranothorite, centrosite, and the whole swag of little trace sulfides in that. So already kind of interesting. The plagioclases have multiple different, uh, there's two different major types in there, or different um, AN contents to them. Alkali feldspar, coarsely porphyritic. We have rapid texture, but not on the classic rapid texture where they're the size of your fist. They're at the few, um, up to maybe a centimeter size, typically. The other thing that's really important in this, in the sense of ore deposits, is there, there's areas that have a lot of graniferic textures. And we're going to talk more a lot about graniferic texture. Um, and when I say graniferic texture, I'm really going to dump, it's really going to be discussions around in, the intergrowth of feldspar and quartz. And then there's myrolytic cavities and micromyrolytic cavities in it. We have that high precision date on it. Even if we don't go down that far, what's the criteria that we would use for knowing we're in fresh granite? Is, is there still magmatic biotite in it? Yes, if it is, it's fresh. If there's no magmatic biotite, it is an altered rock, even though it still might look relatively fresh. The important thing to know is even though when we say fresh granite, I was at a conference several years ago, and, and this quote, fresh but not pristine, is contact actually said, even though we think of a rock as fresh, most granites have, be, have been affected by post-deteric alteration. You know, deteric alteration and then potentially further alteration than that, but rarely pristine. Now, a, a whole swag of just technicolor bits. Again, NQ diameter core. And we're going across and just looking as we go down the hole off of there, and you look at granite texture, granite texture, granite texture. But what's not uncommon in, in, in granites are apolites. We have apolite dikes out there. Um, you also see some areas that are more t just off the center a little bit that, that are a little bit red. You get reddening of the granite. Occasionally, you get some chloritic alteration in it because there's little fractures. That little short piece is actually a quartz tourmaline vein. So you do get veins out in the granite. They're pretty rare, but they're out there. And you also get um, mafic clots, mafic mineral clots, or microgranular enclaves, but nothing unusual, we would say, really, in this granite. And this hosts, hosts one of the biggest deposits on this planet. So we're going to flip on and say, OK, those, those look interesting. Fresh granite, a little bit of alteration moving around in it. But then we go back to that first image that we see, and we see that this texture here. So fresh granite typically has little grains of uh, crystals of quartz and feldspar plagioclase all kind of touching each other like this. Then we see an image that looks like here. Now, when we look at the quartz, which is the white, we see it aligned in trails. And then we see the plagioclase around, and all the, the, the mafic minerals and plagioclase have been altered by sericite chlorate, and that's the green. But we look at that texture. That's no primary granite texture. So what is it? Who knows? It's off from the southern margin of the deposit that we happened to drill back during about, about 2007. A couple holes went down there. Some of the Roxby Downs granite um, displays this quartz beading. And my predecessor at Olympic Dam, a great friend of mine and a brilliant geologist, Ken Cross, told me this back when I first started there in 1992. He said, and he didn't see something as good as that, but this kind of texture what he called quartz beading, occurs across the deposit, you know? And that always stuck in my mind. I thought, yeah, yeah, that's cool, Ken. I don't know a lot about granite. I don't care. I'm just interested in mineralization. But he did refer to it as a coarse graphitic texture at the time. Um, last year, he actually, I showed him that picture, and we talked a lot more about it. And then, so the, here's a whole lot of words. Quartz in parts of the granite have these subparallel curve bands, you know, a little bit more detail. 
his interpretation, Roxby Downs granite upper fractionated part of the bigger Borgoyne batholith at the depth, nothing surprising off of that, that this thing is approaching pegmatitic composition. Now this starts to get a little bit more interesting. Uh, cooled too rapidly with, with halogens, with the presence of halogens that prevented or stopped the fluxing and allowing for big, huge pegmatite growth. So we think about in areas where we see pegmatites, or in, in porphyry systems where there's a lot more quartz around, the textures are different, but some of it's due to our halogen content. The top of the Roxby Downs granite was in place at a shallow depth into still what he believes still cooling Gala Range volcanics. And the uppermost zone where the ore deposit actually sits is altered, and his, his quotes from his words, altered and smashed by early faulting and subsurface phreatic and phreatomagmatic activity. You say, well, that's cool. Shallow level parts of an intrusion. And we always looked at the Roxby Downs granite and always think it was just one phase. You know, probably not, but never actually had strong evidence that it wasn't. So we go through and say that texture in the rock, well, how widespread is it, spread is it across the, the deposit? We really don't see it in those areas on that geological plan outside the gray, which represents the areas where the fresh Roxby Downs granite are. That gray outline represents the Olympic Dam Breccia complex, and it's not until we're within that boundary that we start seeing textures like that. So you start to say, ah, shallower parts of the deposit, is it a, is it a massive cupola of some sort? I don't know, but we're going to talk more a little bit about that. Now, quartz speeding, of course, us geologists, we are scientists. We are scientists that work in the industry, but we have to remember we're still scientists. So consult the literature. And I said, I need something out there that's going to help me interpret what these things are. Or if anybody's recognized it, very recent paper that could talk about the mechanism of quartz grains growing and, and aligning themselves up. And it was really about the, about the physical mechanism of it, not necessarily the causes of precipitation. He had a few nice images, the photomicrograph, and, and the quartz in these things are, are the grays and blacks. And that little colored image is actually an EBSD image, which electron backscatter detector, but what it, what it actually does, is it tells you the orientation of the quartz grains. And what we don't see is like a quartz vein where they would really be kind of the same orientation. That color is shown, there's all sorts of different orientations. Three growth stages. And the three growth stages are the binding of the crystals by rapid necking, you know, so just packing up one against the other, rotation towards lower free energy, because that's always what we want. And, and that starts resulting in, in a bending pattern that we're seeing, and that, that you also just get continual growth, growth of these once they start growing. So I said, that's cool. That For me, that's a nice theoretical paper backed up by some images, but I need something from the ore deposit world. And then in the, in the literature over the last couple years, and looking for something in the literature that talked about this quartz speeding, but whatever literature it came out with, and, and Carter and co. Um, put a paper out in 21 and 22, and they talked about wormy quartz. Ah, that sounds familiar. And looked at some backscatter images, is the gray one, and then the color one is the, a false color image that shows the quartz which the quartz is the darker in the BSC image, and then the feldspars and the, and the and the feldspars, the alkali feldspars, and the albite. This was, though, it was from Urington, and Urington's an excellent district, porphyry copper district in the U.S., because you have eight kilometers of a vertical extent that's completely laid on its side, and it's exposed at the surface. How great is that? I wish we had more of that here. And so those are directly from his things, but you start seeing wormy and thinking, we're cool, we're on the right area. Now, this kind of textures are not discussed a lot in porphyry copper deposits. They're around, but not really a big focus because they're not necessarily super widespread and we're focused in other parts of the deposit. Words from his, him, as we've identified interconnected network of relatively low temperature hydrothermal quartz that is connected to mineralized marlitic cavities within apolite dikes. Well, I like that. This starts to sound, why am I doing any more work? Uh, we propose that, in, in their case, that the porphyry deposit forming fluids migrated from evolved more water-rich internal regions of the underlying granite in the Urington district via the apolite dikes, which contain permeable magmatic crystal mush of feldspar and quartz. And you non-geologists are thinking, here you go, geologists using all your gobbledygook, made-up language that we all do. 
but it's very specific for what we do. It just means pathways, fractures and stuff for pet fluids to move through. And you think, well, that, that's cool. So we've heard a lot about crystal dikes, crystal mush dikes, and I really didn't think much about them until recently, that, yep, I can buy that. The textures that they describe provide petrographic evidence of the transport of fluids through these crystal mush zones. We've heard about that. And that they suggest the process should be considered in future models for the formation of porphyry and similar type deposits. They didn't e e um, elaborate on what similar types deposit, but magmatic hydrothermal deposits that are often in, in felsic coasted systems. Ah, an IOCG. So we'll go on and say, well, that's all cool. What do we see at Olympic Dam? And, and marolytic cavities and micromarolytic cavities, not unusual in a, in a granite. They were first described in Bob Creaser's thesis, not of beautiful images like these. And his micromarolytic cavities had albite, fluorite, and carbonate in them, which always says, what, were they magmatic or some later effect? These are polished thin sections, and the diameter, the, the section across the polished thinny is, is 25 mil. And so just a normal polished thinny on a flatbed scanner of it. And we see that the center of the, of the marolytic cavity, which shows that, that white area or the clear area, and then that little bit of chlorite, which is chloride after tourmaline. And then that intergrowth texture, of which is quartz and K-Feldspar. The black and white image next to it is just, it looks like a black and white image, but it's a plain polarized light in it. And you can see that graphic texture and that graphic or granophoric texture is that kind of wormy or intergrowth of quartz and K-Feldspar. That's cool. It's way out in the granites. But these things actually tell us a lot. And are they only located occasionally out in the granites or they decrease in abundance? They, the, these things, whether they're out in the granite or closer to the deposits, contain quartz, anhydrite, chlorite, sericite, uh, fluorite. The fluid inclusions, which are going to tell us a lot more, are multi-phase, and the quartz in these things are, some are clear, some are turbid, so clear different generations of them, and that lower right-hand image shows nice clear quartz and then really these turbid quartz grow, overgrows on the top of them, and the fluid inclusion populations are different in there. The thing that's really important about these cavities, though, is there's a whole swag of alteration products, and we think about IOCGs on the Stewart shelf are, are, are loaded with copper. Uh, they have uranium, gold, silver, but they have a lot of other elements in them, too. And things like xanatime, monazite, alanite, rare earth, rare earth floral carbonates, Uranium, thorium minerals, there's even chalcopyrite, galene, and spalerite in them. So kind of interesting things, but those are a long ways away. Were they part of that, that Roxby Downs granite? Who knows? What we're going to do now is say, well, let's look at some of these other textures that might be around. How am I doing on time? Okay, cool. I can take a breath. Now, Apolite Dykes was mentioned by Carter, Carter and Co. Apolite apolite dikes. So let's see what we see. Now, these have come about because we've been drilling, not, not me, um, and some of our deep, what we call our deep drilling program, and some of that team is here, then spending a lot of time drilling. And because we're drilling deep into the deposit from the surface, we actually, oh, how unfortunate, have to sit out in the granites and a reasonable way for mineralization to actually angle these holes to get down to the depths that we want and intersect the ore zone, potential ore zones that we're interested in that actually happen to be along or bounded by subvertical dikes, so long angled holes. Beauty. Who would know that I would just go out and look at the granites? But, but I did. And so when we start looking at these granites, and these are just these panels going across, uh, you have apolites, but apolite at Olympic Dam, again, just think about quartz K feldspar, you often see very fine grain material and you know it's felsic. It, is it an apolite? Is it a micro granite? Is it a comminuted granite? It could be any one of those three, but you have to look at thin sections usually to see the difference. Then you see these green things and you immediately think, ah, mafic dike? Mm, not necessarily. It could be a mafic dike, but it can also be an apolite that's had chlorite and um, uh, chlorite sericide alteration or a micro granite that's had that similar alteration over print, or a comminuted granite. Again, you just don't look that much. But then we start going over, and, and the, the, the middle one and then the next one to the right show quite well, is you have these apolites. So the apolites are the ones that are coming diagonal through it. 
where you don't see the typical granite texture, which you do on, on the upper part and the lower part, and then you see quartz that go through them. So here we start having more abundant apolites than apolites that have quartz in them, and apolites that have quartz and actually little tiny gaps in them, which again starts talking about potential fluid pathways. These things, though, become highly altered, so you get these rocks that are from that second one from the right. <sighs> Not a whole lot of texture in it, and it's just completely replaced apolite uh, that's been intensely altered by quartz and sericite, so little glimpses of them. That next image over on the right-hand side shows uh, that same kind of really super fine grain altered apolite, but in the center of it is coarsely crystalline K feldspar and, and, and quartz. And then you say, ah, pegmatite? Pegmatite, no, not necessarily long classic but terms that show up in the literature are pegmatitic orbs and blobs, certainly what it is. It does have uh, intensely altered that out that, that rock that's around it. So we're starting to see more of these textures that suggest a lot more fluid rich environments, not inside the ore deposit. So we go on and even look a little bit more apolite dikes, and then this will be the last version for our non-geology friends here. Just look at the, these beautiful things. Rocks be down granite's not a single phase. We do have porphyritic quartz porphyry, quartz eyes or porphyritic um, intrusions out there or small ones, whether they're dikes or a little bit bigger. Some parts may be a little bit bigger. We've touched on it, and I use the term loosely. The deep drilling team has actually intersected some of these, and that's interesting too. So multiple intrusive phases are always good for helping telescoping events and overprinting events. Next one over, pegmatite that's been fractured in the center of it is, is pyrite and, and tourmaline. We go the next one over, it's, a, it's another pegmatite, so K feldspar, but those black things are actually tourmaline that's not altered. Then you get into more of these, these massive quartz areas, zones a little bit, Cha chaotic, but quartz, uh, and that one had K feldspar tourmaline. We like tourmaline, it's more on the edges of the granites. Then you go along, it gets more juicier where you have uh, quartz carbonates in these things, and, and, and a lot of sulfide, and the sulfides are either pyrite, calcopyrite. Those other two images over there are this, this mess of um, quartz tourmaline veins. The tourmaline's been replaced by, by chlorite, but it's overprinted on the far right-hand side, that, that weird wormy texture that we saw earlier on. So a lot of these things are happening around there. Now, not common inside the granite. So where is it all going on? And I'm, I have to turn my face around here and turn my back to some of you. Now, off of, off of here, let me just make sure I hit the right one. Though, those textures I've been showing you here is in this area where they've been doing that, uh, been working on the extensional drilling over the last couple of years. And, and it's really in this area here. So mineralization sets down here and even a lot deeper. And what we're doing is, is these things are abundant along this boundary. And that's very cool because it starts showing us in an area where we never, we only had really two drill holes to go through it in the past, that these kind of textures are more common on the edge of the rock, on the granite. So this, this cross section that we see, cross section here, uh, a real hypothetical one, but it's not, or a, a working image and it's not bad. Uh, these significant vertical faults, sub-vertical faults were absolutely true. These these veins, pegmatitic material, marlitic cavities are all increasing, particularly as we get relatively close to the to the to the edge uh, around the edge of that breccia complex, and and likewise as we go through that our very deep zone of mineralization, it does end, and you also see you see these these quartz veins and quartz pegmatites and all that off on that edge too, so that's actually that's very cool in itself. So we actually see that these early or I say pre-early mineralization, um, apolite dikes with graniferic texture, pegmatitic orbs, blobs, micromyrolytic cavities, massive quartz zones, plus or minus pyrite and calcopyrite. And then, you, then we also have a, um, in the same areas, post, some post, but we'll say early mineral veins, and the veins are typically you know, sub one half, half a mil to maybe up to three millimeter in size that have quartz, quartz tourmaline, quartz carbonate, quartz, and, and pyrite, calcopyrite in them. So again, these real juicy, mushy zones that were around the edge of the breccia complex. Cool. We're getting very, very close to the end. 
So we go back and think, so the Roxbury Downs granite, merely the host of the deposit, no, that, that's still debatable. This is a nice conceptual cross-section that was put together by, um, by a couple PhD students, students from the University of Adelaide and, a, and a, few years, a few years ago, but before we started doing all this deep extensional drilling. And they're nice, they're, they're nice pictures. We have to modify it a little tiny bit, but you have a magma, deep magma below, that red, and then, of course, the, the smaller plutons coming off of it, they've highlighted a, 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 a cupola-like area around there. Things need to be modified because we have a lot more drilling information in there, but fairly consistent with what we see, potentially, what Carter's talking about that happened in porphyry zones that's known from magmatic hydrothermal ore deposits. So is the Roxby Downs granite the source of the metals and fluids from, for the Olympic Dam deposit? Probably not. However, it's likely the upper fractionated part, what Ken told me a long time ago, of the larger Burgoyne batholith magma chamber. Um, but no matter what model we come up, the model that we come up has to be consistent with what we see happening in the other IOCGs that sit in our region. So just because our other IOCG that's sitting in our region are not sitting in the Roxby Downs granite, they're sitting in a lot older rocks, does that mean that anything's different? No, because invariably we know the ages of mineralization and these other deposits are all 1590. So again, we get down to these deeper Guller GRV Hildebe age intrusions that were providing the source of the fluids. Recent drilling, for the first time ever, provides continuous exposures from the transition of the transition going from altered, um, we'll say altered and unbrecciated granites in towards mineralization. Aplites, myelitic cavities, pegmatitic blobs, massive quartz are all concentrated in areas um, immediately adjacent to our areas of early mineralization. And this may reveal, we're still doing a lot of work off of it, and I, and I use we because that means a lot of people working with, with, with us, and they might provide more of this evidence of these crystal mush dikes or fluid channels. And it really shows us just areas of continual upflow, you know, fluid flow, and that's what we want to set. So we say, as a final thing, is our current studies are focused on interpreting all of these new observations and they continue to evolve our understanding of how South Australian IHCGs form. Thank you.